so as Dr. Higgins has pointed out, I'll talk about um, stabilization of emergency patients. This, I love giving this talk. This is one of my favorite talks to give. And the, the main reason is that there's really two endpoints that I want you to be able to take away from and walk out and be able to apply it to your clinical practice, wherever it may be or whatever you do. So two out of like the 20 odd slides that I have, I really only need you to know two and I'll point them out specifically. And so for me, I'm a pretty simplistic person. This is kind of for me, stabilization for dummies. And I, I don't use that term degradingly. This is kind of what I do myself. All right, so uh, for emergencies, um, how many of you guys work in an emergency practice or see a lot of emergencies? Not a lot. Oh, okay, some in the back there. <laughs> That's good. Um, a little bit of a loaded question that, uh, you know, you don't have to work in an emergency practice to apply these. It, it, unless you work in a morgue or pathology, you're probably going to need to know some of these skills because any live patient... Um, can have an emergency problem. So uh, with an emergency, our um, biggest thing is to act quickly and to move as quickly as we can because uh, patients that come to you are likely surviving on limited physiologic reserves. So, you know, our body's pretty smart. It's going to help us um, defend or de deter any kind of trauma or toxins, but it can only do so for um, so long. And so given that we're a referral practice, it's even um, more uh, of a concept that we have to work on, given that it's probably seen you guys and then come to us before we get our hands on it. Um, so definitely want to emphasize timely uh, therapy is essential. Uh, we usually work on the uh, concept of triaging, uh, so that's basically taking care of the sickest patients first. Uh, and in my opinion, the systems uh, that need most attention would either be the cardiovascular or the respiratory. Obviously, every part of our body is important, um, but if you're going to be able to save a patient in a life-threatening emergency, it's usually due to either a cardiovascular problem or a respiratory problem, but plus or minus brain in there. Typically, with a traumatic brain injury that is really severe, they're either going to die right away, so can't do anything about that, or you know you may be able to do something about them. Uh, so I kind of put plus or minus brain in there as well. Realistic up outcomes is something to hang on to because I think in the process of talking about stabilizing or saving patients that are emergent, it can be a demoralizing process if, you know, you're not used to seeing animals pass or uh, we certainly have a lot of emotions behind them. So um, if you have an animal that has a good expected long-term outcome, then those animals should uh, really be worked on um, as hard as possible to get them back. And those include trauma, uh, drug overdoses, anesthetic complications. So a lot of the ones that uh, you might see in private practice. So uh, things with like spays and neuters, even though as common as they are, they all involve anesthetics, toxins, and then environmental emergencies. Uh, not so much in Vancouver because we're quite quite temperate, but heat stroke, hypothermia, and snake bites. Um, I put this on there specifically, and not because I think any patient deserves any less care, but like your, and I've got a chihuahua, so I'm going to use an example, like an 18-year-old chihuahua with renal failure, congestive heart failure, and three cancers. You're not likely going to save them if they got hit by a car on top of that. So the key importance, this is not one of the slides that um, you need to focus on, but one that kind of lets me calm down a little bit is that uh, when you're stabilizing a patient, this is pretty much what your uh, actions and your demeanor have to be. Because I think if either your lead technician or your veterinarian is kind of flying around, throwing needles around and shouting, then everyone's kind of like that. So I think the, um, the most important thing in any emergency is actually to have everyone as calm as possible. I don't practice yoga, but I probably should. But I, I say that with saying that I have known some people who do a lot of yoga religiously and, and they're probably the most um, excitable people I've also seen. <laughs> Um, the emergency team is potentially made up of um, at least three people if you have the luxury to do so. We, we in most cases, at CanWest, do have the luxury to do that. Uh, you may not if you work in a smaller practice. The emergency team should be made up of a team leader who is the most experienced uh, and can be a calm and quick thinker. I can tell you in my 
training, that's not always the veterinarian. Um, when I started um, in my residency, I was pretty new grad, and I worked with technicians who had like 30 plus ex years of experience working in like a, exactly the setting, emergency, ICU, and I can tell you I did what they told me to do, and that's what how I learned it. So I think if you've been in emergency practice or you're an experienced technician and you're working with a new veterinary grad, uh, feel free to step up and give your opinion because yes, ultimately it's up to the doctor's decisions, but they're probably Probably, especially if they're a new grad, they're probably way more freaked out than you guys would be if you've seen it um, a lot more. Um, I'd say if you had, again, the ability to have three or more people, you want to recognize and utilize each team member's strengths. And so as an example, uh, if you have a team member who really is meticulous with recording, then have them record everything that was given, what time it was given. If you have someone who can intubate anything, you obviously get them to do it as opposed to uh, a doctor to do that. So just kind of know who's around you and let them do what they're, they're best at and always to have emergency equipment readily accessible. So for most uh, clinics, that means having an emergency kit, usually in a nice carrying toolbox or something like that, is um, acceptable. So we're going to basically be talking about, in terms of how to stabilize patients, we're going to be going back to totally basics. We're talking the alphabets, um, A, B, C, Ds, they've added the Ds, they've even added the Es. I'm sure when we're all retired, they're going to be down to the Zs, but I'm just going to um, talk about the A, B, C, and D um, in the order uh, of the alphabet, even though I will point out that it's not necessarily done in this order. This is just so we can go through it in a systematic way. So obviously, area and breathing will tie in together, um, being A and B. Uh, the questions you should always ask yourself, and especially if a technician is the first person on the scene, because your veterinarian might be in an appointment or in surgery, is a patient breathing, and does your patient have a patent airway? It's kind of a binary system, yes or no, right? So um, if no, we want you to suction and clear the airway and intubate them, and then ventilate them. So you can ventilate them using either an anesthesia machine or an ambu bag. Uh, if you ventilate them, I think it's very difficult um, to control your ventilation. Most people ventilate excessively and that will drive the carbon dioxide down, which can be detrimental. So I want you to remember to not overventilate. So if you're going to ventilate, do a normal respiratory rate in a normal animal, which should be about 10 to 12 breaths per minute. The easiest for me is either to look on your uh, watch or a face clock and for every five seconds, just give one breath. If you're on an anesthetic machine, you have a pressure monitor, so make sure you just don't uh, over uh, pressurize the airways as well, so you want to stay under 20 centimeters of water. If you're using an ambu bag, have anyone seen an ambu bag or have an ambu bag? They're great because you can transport them anywhere, you don't have to hook anything up. Um, if you're using an ambu bag, it's a pretty low pressure system, so you usually don't have to worry about causing like barrel trauma or pressure trauma to the lungs, what I would advocate you guys doing is to watch the rise of your patient's chest. And um, as soon as you hit a normal, what we call chest excursion, then that's usually when um, that's enough air that they need. Okay, so that's no if they're not breathing. If they are breathing, so obviously you don't need to um, stress them anymore by uh, trying to suction or clear their airways, but uh, you can always provide supplemental oxygen. Still on long lines of airway and breathing, is your patient working too hard to breathe? Because I think um, those of us that work in emergency and critical care, uh, it's great that the patient is breathing, but it's hard to watch a patient breathe um, with a lot of effort because you're always thinking, oh my gosh, I think this patient's going to lose it soon. And so you do have to ask yourself if the patient is working too hard to breathe. And if that answer is yes, then you do have to reduce their anxiety. Um, mostly drug induced. Um, you might have to even go as far as inducing them and then taking over their breathing with intubation and ventilation. If they are not working too hard to breathe and they're calm and they're sitting there uh, and also um, with cats, uh, usually with uh, minimal stress, they're, they're okay. So you don't want to muck around with them too much. You just really want to provide them with flow by oxygen if they don't seem to be too anxious. So going to some common causes of dyspnea or difficulty breathing, think about 
uh, all the areas of the lungs and the airway, we'll say, that can have a problem. So with pulmonary diseases, that can be contusion, so very common, hit by car, so you get blood into your lungs. Uh, Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema can happen with something like seizures, prolonged seizures, strangulation. So we've seen um, those dogs that get groomed and they're tethered by their neck and then they fall off the table. And so if they're uh, strangled, that can cause uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Nicole talked about this morning with um, trally or transfusion related acute lung injury that's kind of falling into uh, a similar category. Uh, animals that have pneumonia, particularly aspiration is most common, neoplasia and then airway diseases like asthma or bronchitis. Uh, besides the lungs, you've got the pleural space in the chest, so you want to make sure that uh, the pleural space isn't the problem. The pleural space can be filled with air uh, called a pneumothorax or fluid, and then the fluid can be composed of anything from blood, pus, chyle, transudates. Transudates usually from congestive heart failure or uh, low albumin. And then DH stands for diaphragmatic hernia, so again, more trauma-related and uh, causing um, organs or uh, omentum or anything like that to be herniated into the chest, restricting breathing. If we look outside the chest, then you do have the upper airways, and we do have, I think, more so here than anywhere else I've practiced, a lot of brachycephalic animals. And so um, brachycephalic syndrome is uh, something that we do see commonly, and these animals can uh, call, have some respiratory distress, especially on hot, humid days. Uh, tracheal collapse is common in smaller dogs, foreign bodies, I've seen potatoes stuck in the back of throats and stuff like that causing uh, airway disease, upper airway disease, and then for larger, older breed dogs, uh, think about laryngeal paralysis or collapse. Also, common causes of dyspnea ultimately related to the lung, but not the primary cause is cardiac disease causing cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So now going into C, circulation, the question you should be asking is, is the heart beating effectively? And how do you determine that? You've got to either listen to the heart yourself, palpate for pulses, or probably the quickest things to do, and then to get an ECG tracing if you can do so quickly. I don't think a lot of general practices, I, I should take that back, I think they're, they're coming around more commonly now, but it may be used in surgery and somewhere not readily accessible. If the heart is not beating effectively, then you should start CPR, which we're going into. Um, this is the one area where one person, if you only had yourself, then you determine that the animal has um, arrested, then this is the one thing that one person can do. And so I would um, absolutely advocate that if you do find an animal has arrested, to call for help so someone can uh, join you shortly, but instead of um, waiting for the help, you can always start chest compressions first. And certainly on the human side, very recently, just this year, the European Resuscitation Council, which is basically in the human scenario, is the be all and end all of how we do CPR and what you guys get taught at St. John's Ambulance. They have, in 2010, um, released new recommendations and guidelines, and they say by far the best thing for patients who have arrested, this is humans of course, but we're going to apply this to veterinary uh, patients as well, is that uh, if you can do continuous uninterrupted or minimally interrupted uh, compressions, that's going to give your patients the best outcome. So I would absolutely advocate um, starting with C, and so that's why the it's great to remember ABC, but actually C is probably the most important. So with uh, CPCR, and so that's com uh, cardiopulmonary, cerebral, so we think about the brain, so that's a second C in there, and resuscitation. So with um, CPCR, basically there's two techniques. The first one is called the thoracic pump technique, the one that we're probably more uh, inclined and commonly known with. It's for larger animals, so any animals greater than 10 kilograms. What you want to do is place the animal in right lateral recumbency, if you can remember. If you don't, then again, don't worry about it, just place them in lateral recumbency. Run your hands along the widest portion of their chest, so easy, no landmarks, don't count ribs. Just place your hands along their chest and at the highest portion of their chest, I want you to start compressing. You want to compress probably a third of the width, or the height I should say, of the chest, and go as quickly as possible. And so typically for an average um, person that's about 80 to 100 compressions per minute. Um, you can crack ribs and you can cause damage, especially if the animals are like right at 10 kilos. You do have to be 
worried about that. But at the same time, for me, it's either the animal's going to die or you're going to crack a rib. I'd rather have a cracked rib, right? So, I mean, I think if anything you can remember is um, just to kind of do your best in that situation. You can't really do anything worse. The animal's pretty much already dead.